Um, so we are glad that you all are here tonight. We've got some exciting stuff happening tonight. We've got a brand new study starting tonight. Uh, as most of you know, we started in Mark a long time ago. I don't know how many of you even remember that. And then we just recently finished Acts. So that takes us right into Romans, the book of Romans, uh, which is an incredible book. Uh, those of you that have been um, part of Fusion for the last, actually going on the last two years now, two years in June, uh, you, will, you will know that I have been teaching primarily through narratives. Here's what I mean. Uh, early on when I first got here, I went through Nehemiah. Uh, then we went through Genesis. Uh, we went on Wednesday nights, we were going through the Gospel of Mark, and then we went through the, uh, the book of Acts. These are all narratives. In other words, all of these books that we have been studying, uh, they've been telling stories. True stories, I don't mean stories like they're made up stories. Uh, they're true, it's, it's all true, but they've all been stories. We've been following um, uh, stories, obviously narratives. Now we are going to begin to do something much different on Wednesday nights. Now on Sunday mornings, we'll be going into Exodus pretty soon. Uh, so we'll continue with the narratives there. But on Wednesday nights, now we get into doctrine. Now we get into the letters of Paul. And uh, so you're going to see uh, quite a bit of difference in, in, in the way that we are studying together. Um, now you will need to, to know this. This is an opportunity for me to share with you that... When I teach, I uh, primarily will teach devotionally, meaning this. Um, I don't oftentimes go in depth. Um, uh, I, I, so I teach devotionally. I, I might hit some major points, but I try to cover quite a bit of ground. Uh, as you all know, I try to cover a chapter a week. Uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. In Romans, I will try to do that. However, tonight we're covering half of chapter one. So I'm, I'm, I'm breaking that, that, uh, that rule already, which is not a rule really, but um, what I try to do is not slow down too much. Um, what I'm trying to do, what I'm attempting to do on Sundays and on Wednesday nights is to give you enough that I whet your appetite, that I kind of, um, it's like fishing, like I want to put the I want to put the, uh, the lure out there, the bait. And what I'm hoping is that as we are studying on Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, whatever it might be, Wednesday nights in this case, that um, you will notice that I'm not going to go in depth on every single verse. Uh, we're going to move uh, along as, as quickly as we can uh, without missing, obviously, major important things. Uh, but hopefully what this will do is that it will stir up your heart and your mind and that you on your own will take some time to investigate and dig in, learn a little bit more about what we're reading through. So uh, that should work out well because uh, we'll cover our section on Wednesday night and then you'll have some time that following week to go through, dig up some more before we move into the next section the following Wednesday night. So works out real well. It's a good partnership. I do my part, you do your part, and this is going to work out great. Romans is going to be an excellent book for us. It's going to challenge us in some new ways. We're going to learn a lot of new things. A lot of the questions that you have had will be answered as we work our way through the book of Romans. So I encourage you to make sure that you're taking notes. Stick with us each week. And even if you miss it, though try not to miss it, because it's always better live. But if you do miss it, you can always go back to the YouTube and uh, find, uh, find the study for that week and follow along and get caught up. Now, uh, all of that said and done, let's move on here. Uh, I'm going to show you kind of the big picture real briefly, and then we'll get into chapter one here. But you'll see, hopefully you can see that. Uh, a little bit different from what I've, what I've been doing. Uh, but Romans, the first 11 verses, chapter, uh, chapter one through 11, I said verses, I meant chapters. Chapters 1 through 11 of Romans are all about doctrine. In other words, Paul is teaching, teaching, teaching. And then the remaining verses from 12 to the end, uh, chapter 16, I keep saying verses, sorry. Chapters 1 to 11, doctrine. Chapters 12 to 16, duty. So we're going to see the teaching, and then we will see what we're supposed to do with that teaching in chapter 12 through chapter 16. Okay, now tonight, chapter one, again, we're not going to cover all of it. We're going to cover a good chunk of it. 
But what we're going to see is two main divisions tonight. And in case you can't see those, I'll tell you what they are. We will see the salutation. That is a fancy word for the, the uh, introduction. We'll see that in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. We'll see the salutation. Paul is introducing himself to the Romans. Uh, he tells us a little bit about who he is. Uh, he tells us who he's writing to. He tells us the reason that he's writing. And then from verse 18 of chapter 1 down to the end will be all about sin. Now, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to us uh, because you are going to have to, sometimes in Romans, you are going to have to forget chapters and verses. For instance, let me give you an example. We go from chapter 1, verse 18, where we begin to talk about sin and the wrath of God. And that will actually, Paul will carry that thought all the way through chapter 3, verse 20. So it's one big section. Now we won't cover, obviously, all of that, that ground in, in one sitting. Uh, but there are times when we are going to have to break up those chapters and verses in different ways from what we might see or what we might be used to in order to get the flow of Paul's thought. So, all that to say this, let's go ahead and get into our first section here, which is the salutation in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Let's look at it. He begins here by saying, Paul. So he tells us right away who is writing the letter. Now, it's funny because he's not actually the one writing physically, uh, writing the letter. It's Tertius. Uh, we find that out in the very last chapter, so that's a spoiler alert. Sorry about that. I told you it's a spoiler alert after. I'm not supposed to do that. Anyhow, uh, it's, it's, but Paul is the one that's, he's the one that's speaking this letter. Someone else is actually writing it down, writing his words. But Paul really is the author of this letter to the Romans. Now, it's interesting that Paul here uh, puts his name first. We're not used to that. When we write a letter, you and I, we normally put the person that we're writing to first. So I would say, Dear Matt. And then at the very end, you know, I would, I would say, uh, thank you very much for, you know, your time here at Fusion. Uh, but, you know, hit the road, we're done with you. And, you know, love, Chris, or something like that, you know. We're not ever going to do that, obviously. But we, that, that's our styles where we put the, the, we address the person's name at the very beginning that we're writing to. And then at the end, we put our name. So they've got to read the whole letter in order to find out who the letter's from. Here, he puts his name first, Paul. Now, in case you are thinking, oh, there goes Paul. He's, you know, uh, 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 putting his name first out there, getting his name out. I want you to see what Paul does immediately. What Paul does is he does this. He says, Paul, it's the very first thing that he says. And then he says, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now, this word bond servant, I've got to be careful here. I was telling Matt a little while ago, I could actually teach an entire study just from verse 1. So this is going to be a huge challenge for me. There are three things that he says in this verse. He says that he is a servant. He says that he is sent. And he says that he is separated. The first thing that we see there is that he calls himself a bond servant. Now, here's what I did. This first section I titled representative because you're going to see that Paul is representing God here. The very first thing he says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. That, that word bond servant is doulos. And let me tell you why it's different from any other servant. Because this type of a servant, a bond servant, was a servant that served by choice. I'll give you a real quick example. Oftentimes what would happen is a slave would be bought. And at the end of that slave's uh, time of service, he or she oftentimes would choose to stay with that master. I know that goes against everything that you and I uh, know because we, we've got to, obviously, our country has a history of slavery here and we see it as just a, a huge, uh, uh, you know, no, no, we don't, we don't do slavery at all. But you must understand that what we're reading here is, is written during an ancient time, during a time when, when slavery, slavery was largely acceptable. And oftentimes slaves at the end of their term would say, I, you know, master, you've treated me so well. You've taken good care of me. And perhaps even you've, you've even taken good care of my family. I would like to stay. 
and they could choose to stay and come to an agreement where the master and the slave would actually continue their that, that relationship of master and slave. And so Paul is here saying, hey, I am a doulos, I'm a bondservant, I have chosen to be a slave of Jesus. In other words, I'm serving Jesus by faith and not by force. Choosing to do that. So he calls himself a servant, so immediately he says, I am representing Jesus. But then he goes on to say this, a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. That means that he was sent. He had been called by God to be an apostle. An apostle, officially, primarily, an apostle was someone that had seen the risen Lord Jesus. And they, uh, they also had written, uh, authored scripture. And uh, Paul had done both of those things. However, what, what we learn here about Paul is that he was sent. We know that. We just finished Acts. All of us just finished Acts together. And we know that Paul went on these three missionary journeys that we just finished. Remember, we finished with him on his way to Rome. Yeah, he was under arrest, but no doubt he was still on mission. And so we know that Paul had been sent specifically. So he says here that he was a servant that he was sent. And then the last thing he says is that he was separated to the gospel of God. Now that gospel of God is really, that that really is the theme of the book of Romans. Uh, he is going to take the rest of the book, all 16 chapters, to explain to us the gospel and all of its implications. Uh, but what he says here is that he was separated to the gospel of God. Now, I love this because here's another uh, 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 word that we are very, very familiar with. Social distancing or separation. Right now, it's a great thing. Right now, it's stay away from everybody and don't breathe their air and, you know, don't whatever, don't touch the same things that they did, whatever. We, we, we're, we're separated. But... Prior to this, prior to this, we have been taught that separation is a bad thing, that we need to unify, we need to come together. <laughs> and Paul is here, when, when you and I think of separation, we always think in the negative. We always think separate from something, away from something. Well, I want you to notice the, the phrase that Paul uses. He says that I was separated unto or separated to the gospel of God. So he's not separated from something as much as he is separated to. He's set apart to the gospel of God. In other words, his life was completely dedicated to the gospel of God. Paul was not married. As far as we know, he didn't have any kids. The only thing that we know about Paul is that his life was 100% dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel. So when he says, I was separated to the gospel of God, it makes sense to us. We say, yeah, he absolutely was. Especially if we just went through the book, of, if you went through the book of Acts with us, you know that he was all about, he was always on mission, always about promoting the gospel. Now, here's another quick little note if you're jotting things down. Did you notice what he said here? Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So he's now mentioned Jesus Christ, and he's also mentioned God, as in, in, in reference to God the Father. But he mentions both of them. In a little while, we'll see that he mentions the spirit of holiness. And so we're seeing, I mean, so many foundational things in the book of Romans. We're seeing a, a, a Paul believed in the Trinity here. We're seeing Jesus, we're seeing God, we're seeing the spirit. Uh, we'll see the spirit in a few minutes. Um, so many things that I want to stop and uh, focus on, but we need to keep moving. I need to keep moving. Verse 2, still speaking about the gospel of God. Now remember, this is the overall theme of the book of Romans. So as Paul mentions the gospel of God, he says, I've been separated to the gospel of God. He now begins to tell us a few things about the gospel of God. And he says in verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We know that. God had prophesied about the gospel, about Jesus. 
in the Old Testament through the prophets. We know that. Verse 3, still speaking about the gospel, he says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there it is again. We've got God the Father in this gospel message. It's centered on his son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. And then he goes on to tell us this, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So I don't know if you, if you caught all of that, but he talks about his divinity first. He mentions his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he, he references the divinity of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is, was and is divine. He was, was and is the son of God. But then he goes on to tell us about his humanity, that he was born through the, as he says here, the seed of David according to the flesh, meaning that as far as his humanity was concerned, he came through the family line of David. That's obviously a reference to King David from the Old Testament, which that had been promised since uh, from, from the first time that we hear about David, we start to hear about the Messiah coming through his line. He, and, and, and so he talks about his div divinity and his humanity there. So Jesus being 100% divine, 100% human. How does that work? Great question. I don't know. We'll have to get Kenyon back in to answer those kinds of questions, okay? I'm just teaching what I see here, all right? In verse 4, He's still talking about the gospel. He's talking about Jesus. He says, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. This is another incredible verse. When he says the, he uses the word declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. There's a reference to the spirit by the resurrection from the dead. That word declared is actually the word horizoned. Horizoned. Now, here's what he's saying in this verse. It's an incredible thought. What he's saying is this, that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. In other words, there is something that sets Jesus apart. Sometimes you, we come across questions, uh, or this question. Um... Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. We are, uh, we are considered to be the sons and daughters. I don't want to leave the girls out, the ladies out. Sons and daughters of God. So does that mean that we're equal with Jesus? Like he's the Son of God and I'm the Son of God, so we must be equal, right? No. What this verse teaches us here is that he actually is set apart as the Son of God by the fact that he was resurrected from the dead, which I have not been resurrected from the dead yet. Not bodily. I may, uh, I may be considered resurrected from the dead spiritually, but I've not been resurrected from the dead bodily. Jesus is the only one who has done that. And so he is set apart or horizoned or declared to be the Son of God by virtue of his being resurrected from the dead. Told you this thing is jam-packed. I got to keep moving here. Verse 5, through whom, I'm sorry, through him, we have received grace and apostleship. Paul is speaking about himself here. We've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So he's saying, through Jesus, we've received grace and apostleship. And that grace and that apostleship is to be used for the obedience to the faith. So the grace that we've been given, the position that we've been given, is to be used for the faith, for the obedience to the faith. Among all nations. So we are to, to use our, our, our grace and our position to go into all the nations we say, well, to do what? What are we, what are we supposed to do? Uh, we've got the grace, we've got the, the position, the power, and we're to go into all the nations to do what? Well, he tells us there in verse 5, for his name. I want you to remember that this section that we're in is that we're, we're seeing Paul as a representative. And what did Paul just say? He said, we've got grace, 
We've got apostleship. We've got we've got a, 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 a position, and it's to be used as representatives of Jesus Christ to all the nations, is what Paul is saying. Now, while Paul is talking about himself, we also have that same kind of calling. You and I, as believers, have been doused, drowned with grace. And we also have been given apostleship in a secondary sense. Be careful. Not the primary sense. We've not seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. Uh, we haven't uh, um, authored scripture. But in the secondary sense of being sent. Every single one of us has been told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To make disciples. So each of us has the opportunity the privilege and the responsibility. We, we have the same uh, uh, calling and same blessing that Paul is explaining to us right now. He says in verse 6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So now he begins to talk about the recipients, which we'll get to in just a moment. But he says, you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So you've been called also. He's saying to the Romans, I'm saying to you tonight that you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Jesus called you into his kingdom, into his family. He saved you. He called you. And he's got some, uh, uh, some responsibilities for you. He's got a job for you. Your job is to go into all the nations and represent him. Now, uh, before you freak out, let me explain something to you. A few minutes ago, we had Azalea leading worship. She has been gifted, God has gifted her with the ability to sing and play and lead worship. That is her way. That's the way that God is using her to represent him to all the nations. She doesn't necessarily need to take off to Transylvania. I don't know. So I don't know why that came to mind. But I, she doesn't need, necessarily need to travel the world with her guitar leading worship. But she's doing her part right here in Menifee. Somebody's got to do it in Menifee, right? Somebody's got to, got to proclaim the message in Menifee. So God is using her to do that in, in this way, the same way that he uses Matt to do it here and others to lead worship. But then, you know, everybody's got a different job is the point that I'm getting at, okay? So don't think, well, you know, I don't preach the gospel or I don't lead worship, so I guess I'm, I'm free and clear and I can just go on about my business of, you know, becoming, you know, a, a, a tycoon or whatever. That's, no, our lives belong to God. We'll talk about that some more. You see that I'm getting bogged down here? I'm getting, I'm getting excited and I'm stopping. I got to keep moving. Now, let's move on to our second section, which is the recipients. We have the representative, but who's he writing to? Verse 7, it's real clear here. He says, to all who are in Rome. They were called what? Yes, Romans, okay? Romans live in Rome, okay? What do they call people who live in Menifee? What are they? <laughs> I didn't say that, Matt did, okay? Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, so we know who the recipients are. I like this here. He mentions two things about them right away. As soon as he addresses them, he says they are beloved of God, called saints, Beloved of God, he says, you Romans, as, as nasty as Rome was, and it was, those of you who know your history, and if you don't, just Google it, you'll find out that, that there was, um, it, it, for being an ancient city, and you know, sometimes you hear the old people say, well, back in the old days, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't do that kind of thing, or we didn't do that out in the open. Well, let's go way, way back, the Romans did, many did in the ancient world, not just in Rome. But he says to these Romans that he's addressing, and he's primarily addressing the church, the Christians in Rome. He tells them, you are loved of God. You are loved of God. God loves you. It's the first thing that he says. What a basic primary message. And it's one that we fail so often to share with people. It's an easy, simple, beautiful message. God loves you. God loves you. 
So often, many of us are ready to stand up for our rights, to talk about, uh, to, to argue about our, our political positions, and talk about what we uh, think about the coronavirus and what we don't think, and, you know, masks, no masks, masks, no masks. Uh, restrictions, no restrictions, and we're always ready to, to discuss and, and oftentimes argue. But how many of us are passionate about this simple message, you are loved by God? Isn't that true, though? For God so loved the world. It's a simple message. It's a wonderful message. So he tells them two things. The first thing is you're loved by God. God. The second thing he says is you are called saints. Now, this is important. In my New King James Version, it says, called to be saints. And the two words, to be, are italicized. What that tells me is that they are not there in the original language. And that writers added that. They italicized it to let us know. So it's not like they're trying to get something over on us. But they did that to help us, those of us who are these you know, English speakers, uh, to understand it, to, to cause it to flow a little bit better for us. But it's important that you and I know, um, just to be clear, that we are not called to be saints as if we're going to be saints at some point in the future. We're called saints right now. Now, let me tell you why this is such a big deal. Uh, most of you, um, if you're part of the fusion group here, you probably were, were pretty much raised here. Um, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, but I was a pretty bad Roman Catholic. I went for weddings and quinceaneras and uh, on Easter and uh, midnight Christmas uh, masses uh, that were spoken in Latin. I didn't know what they were saying. Uh, so I, I, didn't, I was a terrible Catholic. But in Catholicism, we had saints. And sometimes you might see their image on a candle. Not miraculously. Sorry, that sounded bad. Sometimes they would make candles with a picture of the saint. Or you'd be in church and there would be stained glass windows with pictures of saints. Uh, they uh, oftentimes would have these little cards. I remember carrying one in my wallet for a while uh, with a saint on it. Um, obviously... Uh, Probably several times throughout my life, I would get like a little necklace, medallion, St. Christopher, right? Because my name is Christopher. And uh, so, you know, you have all of these saints. And and saints were something that, that I mean, they were set apart. They were, they were, we thought that these saints were like, they're talking to God on our behalf. So we would talk to the card or the picture or pray to the candle in hopes that the saint on there would then talk to God for us. Well, what we find out here, you know, most of you know this already, but what we find out, this was, this was incredible news to me 20 plus, 27 years ago, to find out that I really was St. Christopher. I was already a saint. Because the word saint means sanctified or set apart. And I have been, not going to be, I have been, I'm called a saint already right now meaning i have been set apart for god's use now um we've talked about this lots over the last i don't know since i've i've been around here again going on two years and in, in june i think it is oh uh, man that's like in a few weeks a couple weeks or something um he, here's the thing um i have I've, I've counseled lots and lots of people over the years, and, and uh, what I have found uh, to be very, very common among Christians who are coming in and, and, and they're, they're in need of counseling, is that many of them, this is, this is going to sound so um, uh, elementary, but I, I'm, about to, I'm about to save you thousands in therapy costs, Okay. Take me out to lunch once in a while or something. Not a big deal. There are so many Christians who do not know or understand that their life belongs to God. At some point in the past, you went down in the sanctuary and you gave your life to the Lord. Or you did it at a camp. 
or you did it with Pastor Heath or your Sunday school teacher when you were little, or you did it at home in the bathtub, or you uh, did it out on a camping trip with your family, wherever it was. But many Christians do not understand that what they did that day when they got saved, and, and maybe because whoever was sharing with you didn't explain it well, but what you need to understand is that when you get saved, what you are doing in reality is giving your life to God, meaning your life is no longer your own. You are a saint. Saint Matthew flows well, doesn't it? Uh, so so uh, the, the word saint means set apart, sanctified. We're, we're saints. That means we're already set apart for God's use. And he wants to remind, Paul wants to remind the Romans that, listen, you're loved by God and you've been set apart for God's use already. Not going to be. You're called saints now. Okay? Let's move on because it says in verse, um, in, in the second part of verse 7, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. He's coupling those two together. Grace and peace from God and Jesus because in Paul's mind and in his heart, he knows the truth. He knows that they are one and the same. Now, you have God the Father, God the Son, sure. But they're both God. What? I know. Where's Kenyon? Okay. <laughs> Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. He was thankful for them. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So there, the Romans had a faith that was world-renowned. Incredible. Uh, may fusion be that same way. May we have faith that's known around the world. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve. There he is again. He's the representative, remember? He's kind of revisiting that, that, that original thought. He says, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. So this is, I'm Paul, but I'm nothing great apart from serving God. That's what I'm doing. That without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayer. So Paul was always praying for the Romans. Making requests, if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. You may be surprised to find this out. That at the time of this writing, Paul had not yet been to Rome. He hadn't been there. And yet he's writing to people, and he probably knew some people there, but he had not been there himself. And it is believed that he is preparing, that he's sending this letter ahead of his visit. Now, whether that is, uh, because some of you are thinking, well, we just finished Acts, and at the end of Acts, Paul is in Rome. Uh, whether Paul sent this letter thinking, hey, I'm, uh, I'm under arrest, and uh, I'm going to be in Rome one of these days or whether he was planning his own trip and the plans got changed on him and he ended up being arrested, whatever it is, it is believed that he's writing this letter uh, uh, um, in, in, in preparation for a trip that he is about to make to Rome. And certainly, uh, those of us who know, again, the book of Acts at the end there, certainly as he arrived in Rome, he must have uh, obviously met with a bunch of these, these people that he was actually writing to. So, uh, here's the third thing that we find in this section. Uh, the representative, the recipients, and now we will see the reason for his writing. In verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. If you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. The reason for his writing was to establish them. In other words, to complete them or to make them secure. In other words, what Paul is doing is he's writing to explain Christianity, the gospel, more fully or completely. That's what we're going to see through these 16 chapters. So Paul's reason for writing is to establish them. But there's something else that Paul wants. There's another reason for his writing. And the reason that he wants to establish them, verse 12. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. 
So he wants to see them established so that he can have, he can gain encouragement. They, they both mutually can receive encouragement from their stronger faith, from their faith being strengthened. And that's, uh, that is an incredible part of what happens when you and I gather together when we fellowship. Uh, that's why we're itching to get back, you know, to, to meeting um, at church once again. Because that's, that's a huge part, is being together here with your friends, worshiping together, studying together, uh, praying together. As our faith is strengthened, we then encourage other people also. So Paul wants that, and that's the reason for his writing. Let's finish up here because he goes on to say in verse 13, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also. He says, I always wanted to come and, and visit you so that I might have some fruit among you. And he doesn't mean like, bananas and grapes and those types of things. What he means is spiritual fruit. Okay, I wanted to have some spiritual fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Um, I love some of the things that you and I are going to learn through the book of Romans that we're all equal. We all stand evenly at the foot of the cross of Jesus. That none of us is better than anybody else. That uh, it doesn't matter our social standing or uh, the amount of money that we might have or the status that we might have or the followers that we might have on Instagram. Those things may mean something to us, to the people around us. But to God, we are all even there, there is no Jew or Gentile, uh, slave or free, male nor female. It's we're we're all the same as far as God is concerned. He says, "I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise." He says, "I'm I'm I'm uh, committed to sharing the gospel with everyone." Verse fifteen. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. To you who are in Rome also. So there it is again. Paul is ready to, he wants to preach the gospel. That's what he wants to do. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. There it is. Many of us are so familiar with that verse. Uh, many of us are familiar with Lecrae and all of the other artists from 116. This is what there, that's how it started. Okay. I am not ashamed. So we're going to see other verses like this that are so well known uh, throughout the book of Romans uh, because it has been used um, uh, for, for uh, ever since it's, it was written, uh, it has been quoted and, and uh, 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 over and over and over again. And so we're going to see a lot of these. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. So the gospel leads to salvation. For everyone who believes. For everyone who believes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. So this gospel was offered to everyone. Made available to everyone. He goes on to say for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So it's Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks, it's, it's everyone. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, meaning it's all about faith. It begins with faith, it ends with faith, it continues with faith. As it is written, here it is from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now that, that verse is used three times in the New Testament. Uh, the first time is here in Romans. The just shall live by faith. 
And the em emphasis in Romans is the just or the justified. So we're going to be hearing uh, about, if you go, well, what is the justified? We'll talk about that at a later time. I'll explain all of these things. But it's, it's focus in the book of Romans is on just being justified. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about that uh, as we make our way through the chapters. The second time that it's used is in Galatians. And the focus there is on how to live. The just shall live. The emphasis there in Galatians is on how to live. And then finally in Hebrews it is used there also. The just shall live by faith. And uh, in, in the book of Hebrews the emphasis when it's used there. The emphasis is on living by faith faith or by faith. Um, and, and so we are going to have a, uh, I think, a, a, a challenging, in a good way, challenging time as we go through the book of Romans. Uh, I have been challenged already. We're only halfway through the first chapter. And um, we are going to learn so much. And I am excited to, uh, to take this journey with all of you. And I'm hoping that you will join us every single week Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and hopefully we'll be back together very soon.